Dr. Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline, um, afternoon of day three here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, so we're getting close to wrapping up the recording aspect here. We're getting a lot of great information, and we're going to continue it. And something very close to my heart, um, Colorado's new opioid guidelines with Dr. Don Stater. Um, if you are a podcast person, you may uh, recognize this podcast, Emergency Medical Minute. I mean, we are we are flush with great podcasts in emergency medicine. We've talked about them a couple of times, and um, I'm definitely not proprietary with podcasts. I want everybody to have all the access they can to great information, so uh, absolutely uh, add that to your list. I've got two new ones uh, to make sure that I'm subscribed to um, all the time, and I know people that podcast but I don't always know the name of the podcast. And that's one of the difficult things with, uh, with iTunes is being able to put the person you know with the podcast they actually produce. But I'm from Kentucky. I'm uh, in the epicenter of the opioid epidemic. We've all had um, a lot of legislation and things that come through it, but Colorado seems to be uh, taking a unique approach of saying not only are we going to address the issue, but we're going to take the bull by the horns and, and lead um, and that's on something that's now spreading outside Colorado. So tell us about um, your, yourself, where you practice. Uh, I didn't even mention it yet. Donald, uh, Dr. Donald Stater, Don Stater, emergency physician in Inglewood, Colorado. So that makes sense. Um, so give us some background on the, yourself, your practice in the program, how you got interested in the uh, opioid epidemic. Great. Well, th- first, thanks so much, uh, Ryan. I really love your podcast on ASAP Thank Frontline you. and really enjoy listening to it. It's on my podcast list of things I listen to, you know, every month or when I'm taking a job. Well, it's coming now. Uh, as of last month, it's going to be once a week. So we're going oh, to wow. fill you full up. Oh, that's all kinds awesome. of plenty of stuff. That's awesome. That's, uh, you know, and I look forward to enjoying all the great program you put together. Oh, thank you. So thank you. Let's start with the thank you. Uh, so like Ryan said, I'm Don Stater. Uh, I run a podcast called the Emergency Medical Minute, and we specialize in clinical podcasts, which are bedside teaching. Each of our podcasts is usually only five minutes, but we put out one a day. So we've only been around for around six months, and we've got around 150 podcasts. They're short, they're sweet, they're to the point, they're to an ED doc's uh, attention span, and each one is recorded live in our emergency department. So you don't have to hear me drone on, it's actually my whole group will talk about what they've learned from different aspects. So That's a fantastic approach to it. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and that's exactly, and people ask, how do I determine how long my podcasts are going to be? Mm-hmm. It's like I have to think about emergency medicine from my mindset. Yep. Um, that I don't have a great, fantastic attention span. So what I driving into work, out of work, and then maybe on a treadmill or a, a climber, about 20, 25 minutes is about, I think, when a lot of us yeah. tap and, out or we get to the house and pull up and, and, and finish it up. So and, and, the, you, and the cool thing we do, too, is every once in a while we'll do something a lot longer. But for all those, I need to make sure that the person I'm interviewing and me has a beer. So we go to a local brewery in Denver. There's a ton of them. We each grab a few beers. We do a podcast. We drink together. And then we usually get to some pretty interesting conversation. Oh, man. There's, uh, of course, here in Las Vegas, there are actually a couple of places serving here in the exhibition area. There's actually an open uh, I mean, a cash bar over here. And I think they're doing some samples over here with some Kentucky bourbon. Interestingly, I don't think it's a group from Kentucky, but it's good Kentucky bourbon nonetheless. Unfortunately, with the number of uh, podcasts we're not going to have here at ASEP, if we were ha- sharing beverages with each person that came in, it would be a lone podcast with somebody else by the end of the day. <laughs> well, well, you should come out for one in, uh, in Colorado. You've now got I'd a formal invite. To. Um, so you ask a few questions there. So I'm a practicing emergency physician in a community practice in Inglewood, Colorado, uh, with a group called CarePoint. Um, how I got so impassioned about this was I was actually on a shift with a young lady who overdosed. And she overdosed on something bad. She needed multiple doses of Narcan. She was with me for a long time. And for a while, she was my only patient. So I actually went in and I sat down with her. And I asked her, how did you get hooked on opioids? And she told me this heartbreaking story about how she was a college student who sprained her ankle and went to an ED and got a prescription for 20 Percocet. And those 20 Percocet made her feel way too good. And she started taking them because they made her feel good. She started getting them from her friends. And before she knew it, she had dropped out of college. She had become addicted to heroin. She had been kicked out of her home. 
And now this smart young lady was homeless living on the streets and overdosing and overdosed on heroin. That's an interesting. It, it, and the number, I think when people think of the opioid crisis, the epidemic, they're thinking about the person, the only risk is that person that we're putting on long-term, months of opioids. Yeah. But I've got a, a story, a, a lady that I went to high school with, she got hooked on one mm-hmm. that was prescribed. You never know that wiring that, in, that exists in somebody's brain, the addiction wiring, how prone somebody is, especially if they've used substances through high school, during that developmental stage, laying down that pathway, the family risk factors. So it's not necessarily that long-term prescribing. I mean, it's something that we have to be cognizant of um, in the emergency department because even one pill in the right person. So each person we prescribe to is a little bit different. So give us the lowdown on, on your program itself. Yeah, so, and, and I want to echo, you're so right. It's, addiction is a disease. Some people are prone to the disease. So if you give it to the wrong person and you don't screen them, I've started screaming all my opiate people. I said, do you have a family history of addiction? Mm-hmm. Is your, anyone an alcoholic? Has anyone had problems with drugs? And in so, I have a very thorough discussion that these medications might make you feel very good and you're gonna have to really be cautious if I prescribe opiates at all to them. So it's something that we have to be much more cognizant of. And if you look at harm statistics, there's no more harmful, more addictive drug with bad withdrawal effects than opioids. It's the worst narcotic and we prescribe it every day. So some of this has been a real transformation in my understanding of how bad these drugs are. And I'm not saying never prescribe opiates. I'm saying this is a real risk benefit thing. Now you asked about the program that we're putting together and uh, Colorado ASAP should be coming out with guidelines formally at the end of this year. But when, I, when we looked at these guidelines, uh, we actually looked at them, just, not just emergency doctors, but we got people from the harm reduction community, we got the Colorado Consortium, we got the Colorado Hospital Association. All of us came together and we said, we can't just print a no list. Because mm-hmm. prescribing guidelines, you know, which I think are extremely important, great step, but a lot of them just say, no, 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 no. Don't do opioids for X, Y, and Z. Don't prescribe more than 20 pills. But ER docs just can't be telling people no. We have to have other solutions. So it's about telling people no and reducing our prescribing of opiates. But it's also about giving us alternatives. And here's where the wonderful work that Dr. Rosenberg on the ASAP board has done and that Alex LaPietra uh, in their shop, which the media has wrongly coined an opioid-free ED, yep, right? Absolutely. It's, a, it's a wrong coinage, but it's an opioid's second line or an opiate's last ED. It's basically refocusing on the evidence. Yeah, it I is. I mean, it, it, and both of them have been here on the, the Frontline uh, podcast um, uh, Rosenberg, Dr. Rosenberg, from back uh, when we were in Washington, D.C. this spring, and uh, Alexis uh, LaPietra, was, we have recorded her yesterday. And I, I think it's absolutely, I think people are taking the eye off the ball with saying it's an opioid-free ED, and since it's a headline, they're reacting to that mm-hmm. and not looking into what it really is, which is refocusing the doctors in the emergency room on the evidence that says this is what actually works, yeah. Don't fall for the easy button that has gotten us in this system yeah. in this problem that we're in. The mistake that some that we have made for too long is pain equals opiates. Yes. That's not right. Pain, what type of pain? How can we treat that more effectively? Can we use NSAIDs? Can we use IV lidocaine? Can we use lidoderm patches? Can we use Haldol? Can we use all these other things that are also effective pain medications without exposing people to the risk? And I should mention ketamine too, which is now uh, has always been one of my favorite drugs, but with pain Good pain dose ketamine, I have expanded my use of that tremendously, mm-hmm. and I think for the great benefit of our patients. Um, the, other, the, last, the other component that we have is, you know, one, say no more often. Two, use an alto paradigm when you treat pain. The third one is really something that's novel and that I think is one of the most important pieces, and that's pushing harm reduction from the emergency department. Now, I'm going to ask you, uh, Ryan, I'll put you on the spot. How much do you know about harm reduction and what it is to give harm reduction counseling? Well, I think it's, a, well, it's, it's a little bit not fair because I bought in on the opioid thing many years, many years ago. So I've, I've been so, lecturing for six years on the progression of the opioid epidemic. So I've always been one that's felt like one of our major roles in the emergency department is education and prevention. We should be one area of medicine that is diligent at working ourselves out of a job. 
by not having anybody come into the emergency department because we've kept them safe and healthy. So I think that's the future of medicine, and that's where we're going to make this where we're, you know, that's what, what I like to say is it's the way we're going to make the Affordable Care Act affordable. Yeah. You know, if that's where we go, uh, don't, don't throw rocks at me depending on your politics, but just saying, you know, th- our, the best tool we're going to have is prevention and keeping people healthier, and then we're still there to respond inevitably when folks do end yep. up sick. And here's, I had no idea how limited my understanding of harm reduction was, uh, is how I, when I started educating myself and I went to a harm reduction center, which basically a needle exchange program that gives needles mm-hmm. to everyone in downtown Denver. Yes. And I said, what are you telling your patients? And I was blown away by how ignorant I was. Because what the counseling I got taught was tell them to quit and tell them to not share needles. Boom, you're done. You're not done. Because, you know, yes, telling them not to share needles might decrease your chance of getting, getting HIV. But hepatitis C, you don't reduce that very much by just telling them not to share needles. Because hepatitis C is a hardy drug. It lives in the syringe. It lives in the cotton. It lives in a cooker that you're recycling. So all of those things have to go each time they use. Mm -hmm. Another thing is by speaking, and I've got to know now a bunch of people in the addiction community who were addicted to heroin, is where their water source is coming from. Mm -hmm. Some people are using saliva. Do you want to know why a lot of people get abscesses? Because they don't inject cleanly. They use things like saliva sometimes, and they don't have enough materials. So it's something where if you don't understand what people are doing, you can't counsel them on how to do it correctly or at least in a more safe way. So here's the controversial thing that I asked as an lecture. I said, how many of us know how to shoot heroin? Because every ER doc should know each step to shooting heroin mm-hmm. so that when something co- goes wrong with your heroin addicts or your IV drug users and they come in with that big abscess or they come in with neck fash, you can say, hey, how did you shoot how did you shoot this? What, how did this develop? And if you find out they're not shooting heroin correctly, that they're using a bad water source, that they're not cleaning their skin, then that's something that we can educate them on. Because I'm not naive to think, oh yeah, my two minute talk is going to change, you know, going to get that person to quit, right? But, but maybe my talk will tell them how to never get an abscess again. Maybe it will prevent them from getting endocarditis. Maybe it will prevent them from getting hep C. You know, all those things that are going to improve that person's life. So on the day that they're ready to walk away from their addiction, they can do so and not have their health have been permanently adversely affected. Well, at some point, I mean, the way you look at it as, as the physician, emergency physician, or us as a society as a lifeguard, mm-hmm. we've got to prevent them from drowning before eventually we can teach them to swim. And that's what we're trying to do in the emergency room. A lot of times it's rescue. And like, why not? They're just, they're junkies. Just, just let them go. Why are we wasting money on Narcan? Well, for one, it's initially it's a choice. But then once that wiring is in place, you no longer have that choice. It's a disease. It's a disease. It is a disease. As much as your brain tells you you need to breathe, as much as it tells you you need to drink and eat and bathe, it tells those people that they have to have that to survive. And so it is a disease. And so whatever it takes for us to limp people along, to rescue them until they reach that point where they're ready to recover. And that's how we get out of this system is with recovery, yep. not with, re- you know, we, we do need to make sure that we are um, wise with our prescribing, that we do things based on evidence-based medicine, such as the Alto program, but also understanding that until we get the people out of the addiction and recovered, all we will do is eventually change the substance to something else, whatever's the next to come down the pipeline. Yep, yep. And, and I think, too, in harm reduction, it's about knowing how to talk with people, mm-hmm. knowing, knowing where those pitfalls are, giving them Narcan or at least prescribing them Narcan. And if you're not a state that has basically over-the-counter Narcan in your pharmacy, you should go advocate for that because those people need access to that life-saving drug. Narcan should be everywhere in our IV drug-using community, and it's been shown in multiple studies to help save lives. Oh, it's absolutely going to save lives. Yeah. The, the, but, but your argument, it's the, it's the same argument that you have with the needle exchanges you have in my town or, um, or the Narcan or the safe injection sites or whatever they may be. May be. The, the argument is always, well, you're just enabling the problem. Yep. Well, no, we're bridging, the, we're bridging the disease and addiction until we can, until we can fix it. Yep. And I don't mean fix it. I almost said cure, but you don't. It's putting it into remission. Yep. 
I mean, we're trying to put the addiction disease into remission, and we're not going to be able to expect that to happen just because somebody has a near miss, and they go, oh, I shouldn't do that anymore. Well, they may say that for a minute, but then in 45 minutes, their brain says, okay, we yep. really need this right now. And when people are dope sick, they're desperate, you know? Mm -hmm. dope, when people are going through withdrawals and they're dope sick, that is one of the most uncomfortable feelings that our patients have. And we need to realize that this is why these drugs are so hard. They give you a wonderful high. Once your body gets used to them and addicted to them, when you try to quit, it gives you a big stick, yeah. right? So people have real tough times. The last thing is that, that part of it. People need help coming off these drugs. We should really be pushing to send these people to medical assisted treatment, to suboxone centers, to methadone centers. We should be part of that referral safety net that says, hey, we've identified this problem. You may have almost died from this problem. You may just have come in withdrawal, but you're seeking recovery. We should have a clear place to send those people. And right now, communities struggle sometimes because they don't have a place. Mm -hmm. But we should be the advocates saying we should start them. And I know two ER docs, at least in Colorado, who are going into addiction medicine because they see the tremendous cost of this crisis. And we have other people who are trying to open MATs. And to me, I take my hats off to those people because they're addressing what is one of the biggest public health crises in our nation, which is the opioid epidemic. Oh, so it's by far the largest addiction crisis we've ever oh. had in the United States. And if you haven't been to, um, didn't catch my talk here on the uh, opioid legislation, uh, uh, narcotics to Narcan, or, or happen to be at SEC ASAP or Tennessee ASAP, it's more cost effective by $32,000, $32,000 cheaper to put somebody in addiction recovery, inpatient addiction recovery than it is to put them to jail. And that's been our answer on the war on drugs, is throw everybody in jail. But if you're wanting somebody to get better, jail is the worst place. Yep. Now, fine. We want to punish the dealers, the suppliers, those people that are, that are stocking the shelves of the, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the street pharmacy. Fine. Do that. That's, that's the way Kentucky's gone. We're trying to, they're trying to separate the two things, the addict from the supplier. But when it comes to the addict, um, I, I really think our states need to wake up, get our head, heads out of the sand, and really invest in recovery resources. Mm -hmm. Because if, those, if the street pharmacy is stocked full of illicit drugs, which it will be. There's no way we're going to get rid of it. We've seen for the last 35 years of the war on drugs that we're not going to clear the streets of drugs. But recovery comes when there's nobody there to shop at the store. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get people cleaned up and take them out of the situation, then we may have a chance. And I think that we're going to have to turn the corner because it's not just an addiction crisis. It's an addiction now and complication crisis, whether it's abscesses, infections, foreign bodies, endocarditis, hepatitis B, C, HIV, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. We are going to be on the hook for the public health crisis that's going to develop and be the secondary tidal wave that comes with this. Yep, exactly. And that's and the, you, you and me are much of the same mind because I think we need a revolution. We need to revolutionize how we treat pain and addiction from the emergency department. Mm -hmm. And who better to revolutionize and to lead that fight than ER docs? Because no one, no one sees addicts and people struggling with addiction the way we do. This is our jam. This is our fight. This is ours to take on to improve the health of our population and our community. So emergency doctors have to be at the front line of fighting this epidemic. And I'm so glad to hear people like you and people across the country starting to stand up for it. And we hope in Colorado that our efforts to create this comprehensive opioid guideline are going to be part of our state's solution. Because every place across the nation, whether you're in a hub like Ohio or Kentucky or downtown Denver, which has some of the highest rates of opioid overdose in the nation, we all need to figure out a better way to treat these patients. What are the next steps for the program? You mentioned it's likely going to the guidelines, will likely be released later in the year. What are the next steps, and then where do you go from there? Well, the, we're through our second draft. We're still adding. For example, we just found out docs who are prescribing Suboxone from the emergency department, right? And using Suboxone to get people out of, out of, uh, out of withdrawal. And we're hearing their arguments for if that should or shouldn't be in the guidelines. Mm -hmm. We're also considering needle exchange. 
Now, here's a, here's a very controversial, but makes a lot of sense from public health perspective um, approach to IV drug use. There was a town in Indiana. Scioto County. Yep, you got it. That there's a population of 4,000 and around 1%. Portsmouth, that's the name of the test. Yeah. It's off the book. Uh, no, 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 we're talking about um, Portsmouth, no, Ohio. Yeah. Scioto County. The Indiana was the HIV. HIV, I'll roll exactly. into the Ohio one in a minute. Yep. But in, in this small town in Indiana of 4,000 people, there was around a large population of IV drug abuse, and 400 of them got HIV, uh, one of the largest outbreaks of HIV in the nation. And it's all because we didn't do harm reduction well. We didn't have needle exchange in place. People recycled their needles, they shared them with family and friends, and a whole community has been devastated and some members with lifelong disease. So what if that local ED was the location for that needle exchange? Not that they need to check in, not they need to do anything like that, but they had a place that they can go. And on the day that they wanted to get clean, they had an area that was able to see them and refer them appropriately. That's the biggest thing that I think is the challenge for us is we need to take better care of these people. And if that would require rural communities without resources to potentially be that resource, my question is why not? Now that's something that we need to vet. This is my own personal, that, that's my own personal feeling, but, uh, but I wanted to advance that because we are trying to hammer out and build consensus on some of these things which are really revolutionary to think of how we can do things better than the ED. But like I said, we need a revolution, we're gonna lead it. Well, since that led us astray, uh, had a moment there to check the name. Austin, Indiana Austin is, is, the, is the town. That's very close to uh, probably within about an hour and a half of where I live. And then you have where I was talking about the uh, Scioto County uh, in Portsmouth, Ohio, uh, source of the book Dreamland, which is where a significant portion of the opioid outbreak took place. They actually put in a needle exchange and cut their hepatitis C rates. By oh, 50%. Huge. And, and here's the thing with people who get fired up and tell me, well, this is stupid, you're enabling. Who the heck do you think has to try to go find an IV in these people when they fried their veins? It's your nurses. It's your doctors. We're, we're creating a huge potential problem for us, too. Because when we do that, that's, those difficult IVs are some of the highest rates of sticking ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is a problem. If you're not solving it for your patients, which should be first and primarily, then you should solve it for the interest of your staff. You know, the people that you work with, that you call your brothers and sisters in arms every day. All right, so we've got Dr. Don Stater, uh, Emergency Medical Minute podcast, and also instrumental in working on the uh, on Colorado's new opioid guidelines. Probably have a release by about the time the podcast uh, is released here in the next couple of few months. So uh, let folks know how they can get in touch with you, whether by email or social media. Yeah, well, my, uh, my email is my name. It's donald.stater at gmail.com. I'm almost on that, always on that thing, and I will shoot you an email back if you have any questions. And I'm happy to share these guidelines with, with you, with the rest of ASAP, emergency medicine, et cetera, especially when we come out. We're very proud of the work that we're doing, and I'm also very proud. I'm going to give a shout-out because we've got 25 people on our task force from different agencies across Colorado, and they have worked their butts off to produce what I think is going to be very transformative for our practices. Are you on Twitter? Yep, I am on Twitter. I'm not a big tweeter, though. That's okay. What's, I, your, what's your handle? It's, uh, uh, I think it's... Don Stater. I, I, I haven't accessed that. <laughs> I'm going to find in it in a minute because we're going to take a picture and we're going to put it on there. So <laughs> okay. we're going to find That's it great. here very shortly. As for me, you can check us out, ASAP Frontline, on Facebook. Check out our page, like it. We'll keep you up to date on the weekly releases from our podcast as well as on Twitter at Everyday Med. Some serious stuff and some uh, humorous stuff on there. Um, you can get on there and, and check it out. You'll find out very quickly. Um, you can also email me at youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. That's youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. Thank you.